This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you Episode 8 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman was published in Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. I've been publishing extracts from the Wardsman and the Westford Eagle since January 2008 in the weekly Museum Musings column. In this episode, we'll be reading the Westford Wardsman for Saturday, February 22nd, 1908. And I will add uh, comments as appropriate to elaborate on what was happening in Westford 113 years ago. So the first section covered on February 22nd, 1908 was the Westford Center section. It is no uncommon occurrence for people to report seeing deer. But one day recently, one was seen at pretty close range. Mrs. M.J. Wheeler saw it near the house, which is uh, at 66 Main Street, across the street from Whitney Park. From her west windows, she hastily called Mrs. L.W. Wheeler, who, who lived in the same house. But in the brief interval, the deer had disappeared. It seems it had crossed Main Street, no to the grounds at the rear of the academy, 65 Main Street, and presently they saw him bounding back, jumping into the long stretch of currant bushes next to Mrs. Fletcher's Lane, uh, which is now Wheeler Lane, and leaping gracefully away. Just as it crossed the street, Ernest Dane and L.W. Wheeler happened to be coming from the post office, and they too had a fine view of the beautiful creature. It was during the intense cold weather, and one could not help wondering how the animal got food and shelter enough to keep alive. Uh, I might add, if, if it was an ancestor of the deer that uh, visited me, visits me every winter, it's, uh, it finds nourishment by eating the shrubbery around the house. The sharp cold weather recently has put rather a stop to the finding of dandelions in bloom, etc., but in... Saturday's mildness of temperature, Mrs. A.W. Hartford found a beautiful large butterfly actively flying about. A.H. Foss has been on the sick list this week with Dr. Wells in attendance. The closing party given by Miss A- Miss Ethel-, Ethel M. Fowl, Fowl's dancing class on Valentine's night was a very pretty and enjoyable gathering and reflected much credit upon all who carried out the arrangements. Besides the young people in the class, it was well attended by interested parents and friends. The decorations were very appropriate to the day, being festoons of gaily colored paper hearts around the walls and a network of more hearts interlaced above the slate with cupids above. Hibbard's orchestra furnished music, and ice cream and cake were served at intermission. In the pretty figures of the opening march and subsequent dances, the members of the class showed the excellent results of the training of their youthful, graceful teacher. Patrons of the library are reminded that the building will not be open on Saturday, February 22nd. The annual closing of the library will be later than usual this year on account of the change in date of the school vacations. All books will be called in on Tuesday, March 17th. Uh, The the next section is entitled Noted Women. In a recent list of eminent American scholars compiled by Owen Wister, I, I might just mention that Owen Wister was an American writer and historian, Uh, considered the father of Western fiction. He's best remembered for writing The Virginian, and he also wrote a a, a well-known biography of Ulysses S. Grant. So in a recent list of eminent American scholars compiled by Owen Wister, it was noticed that there were no women's names, and the question arose if there were none who deserved recognition in this list. As a result of this investigation, the names of 19 women who were considered distinguished scholars of the present day were added, and of this 19, three are associated with our hilltop town, and therefore Westford people can bask in a sort of reflected glory of intellectual achievement, and we are glad to acknowledge the first as Alice C. Fletcher. Uh, she was born in 1838 in Havana, Cuba, and died in 1923 in Washington, D.C. 
who has written valuable books dealing with ethnology and archaeology. She has particularly studied the Western Indians and in order to know them thoroughly, lived among them several years. There is probably no other scholar in the country, man or woman, who has such a complete knowledge of the various Indian dialects, of Indian manners and customs, and of Indian folk songs. The latter she has translated in translated with singular fidelity, bringing out all the rich beauty of their involved symbolism. The Peabody Museum Fellowship at Harvard was created by Miss Fletcher and has been held by no one else. For the museum, she has done much of her work. She is one of the few women members of the Washington Academy. Her ancestors lived in the house now occupied by Melbourne F. Hutchins, and the family graves are in our West Long Cemetery. I might add that uh, Alice Fletcher probably never set foot in Westford, and it's a bit of a stretch to say she was, quote, associated with our town, end quote. But her great-grandfather, Peter Fletcher, was born in Westford on January 11, 1736. He moved to, Ips to New Ipswich, New Hampshire, about 1762, as did a, a number of men from Westford, families from Westford. So we will claim her as one of Westford Fletcher's. And continuing with this story, there is at least one woman who excels in chemistry. Professor Ellen H. Richards, uh, maiden name Swallow, born in 1842 and died in 1911, instructor in sanitary chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, was a member of the first class graduated from Vassar and is now a member of the Washington Academy. Before she began her work with MIT, she was the chemist for the Massachusetts State Board of Health. Many valuable books have been written by Professor Richards dealing with sanitation, with air, water, and food analysis, and with ventilation. She has also made an exhaustive study of food in the general diet and of sociology. Quote, my work is only missionary End quote. She says, quote, I merely teach others to go about the big things, end quote. But it is recognized among scientists that Mrs. Richards herself has discovered a number of big things. Uh, I'll add that uh, she was an, an 1862 graduate of Westford Academy. Her parents were Peter and Fanny Taylor Swallow, and they moved from Dunstable to Westford in 1849 uh, specifically, so... Um, her, their daughter, Ellen, could attend Westford Academy. Peter Swallow ran a small general store that was located about where the driveway of the J.V. Fletcher Library is now located. Ellen uh, Swallow Richards would address the Tadmuck Club in December 1908 and again in November 1909. She also donated one of the six memorial windows, windows in the Dunstable Church to the memory, to quote, the memory of Peter Swallow and Fanny G. Taylor, his wife. This church is formerly the Dunstable Evangelical Congregational Church, but as it's the only church in Dunstable, it is commonly called the Dunstable Church. And back to the article. The third in this notable trio is Dr. Nettie M. Stevens, born in 1861 and died in 1912, and an 1880 graduate of Westford Academy. She's in, she is an instructor in biology at Bryn Mawr. Dr. Stevens has made an enviable record for herself in biological research. Uh, that's the end of this article. I might add that, uh, that uh, Dr. Stevens was an American geneticist, although that term was not in use at the time, who is credited with discovery of the X and Y sex chromosomes, which is no small accomplishment. She not only graduated from Westford Academy, but also taught there from 1885 to 1892. Dr. Uh, Stevens was a friend of Miss Emily Fletcher of Westford, and also is, uh, she was a noted biologist in her own right. Uh, biographies of all three of these uh, women scholars discussed in the Wardsman are available online at wikipedia.com. The next section is the About Town section. Mr. and Mrs. Hamlet quietly, quietly observed the 62nd anniversary of their marriage last Wednesday. Time and change have allowed them to preserve an elastic step 
and an unclouded intellect, and they are both young to the best interests of society. Among those who called were their daughter-in-law, Mrs. Nellie Pope Hamlet of Fitchburg, Mrs. Charles Watts, and Mr. and Mrs. S.L. Taylor. That, of course, is uh, Sam Taylor, who writes this section of the Wardsman. Owing to the storm, several, several old-time friends and admirers answered the roll call of memories harvest at home. At a meeting of the selectmen, Andrew Johnson, J. Everett Woods, Hans C. Deggie, D-E-G-E, Charles Edwards, and Walter A. Whitten were drawn to serve on the jury at the United States District Court to be held in Boston. Uh, this was a common way of uh, obtaining uh, jurors was to have uh, some sort of an, uh, a drawing among the, I think it was among the landowners or perhaps among the registered voters of a town, and it was overseen by the selectmen in each town for various courts, courts in the county and for the federal court. The selectmen have appointed as fire commissioners, commissioners Captain Sherman H. Fletcher for Westford Center, Albert R. Schott for Graniteville, and John Edwards for Ford's Village. At this time, each village, each of these three villages had its own hose company, as they were called. Last week, Friday, Miss Irene Regg, R-E-G-G, fell and broke her leg. She is an elderly lady, and it happened while crossing the field from the Levi T. Fletcher Farm, which was located at 120 Lowell Road, to Brookside to take the cars. After the fall, she lay nearly an hour before her call for assistance could be heard. She was removed to her home with Miss Sarah Richardson, whose companion she has been for several years. The Levi T. Fletcher House, I might add, is also known as the Richardson House. Doctors Sleeper and Wells were called, and Miss M. Pearl Haynes of Boston uh, was obtained as a trained nurse. The selectmen called a meeting of the citizens last week, Thursday evening, to consider matters relating to the annual town meeting. Edward Fisher was chosen chairman. The meeting was largely informal and entirely friendly. The real basis for calling the meeting was to devise means for keeping the tax rate down to the present rate, $15 on a thousand. Edward M. Abbott, on behalf of the selectmen, made a financial statement of the amounts raised last year, including all extra expenses, and the amounts the town could raise this year and keep within the desired limits. The extra expenses this year are $1,600 for hydrants, $2,200 for the apparatus, and $1,600 on a new schoolhouse. These amounts were about offset by the extras of last year. Having roughly ascertained the financial strength of the town, which would leave a balance of $3,500, many new articles for the annual meeting were proposed and discussed. L. W. Wheeler, as tax collector, in a few well-chosen and pungent remarks, proposed, proposed the plan of discontinuing all discounts on taxes interest to commence not later than November 1st. He quoted from the tax commissioners to the effect that very few towns offer any discount, while this town offers two rates of discount, 5% to November 1st and 3% to, to December, December 1st. What, what he's talking about here is a discount on your tax. If you paid your tax before November 1st, you got a 5% discount. And if you paid it before December 1st, you got a 3% discount. The collector was able to show that all discounts as a financial saving were more imaginary than real, that the income of the town was $1,000 less this year on account of discounts. The sentiment of the meeting resulted in a disagreement. The arguments were for, for discontinuing, Custom, which is stronger than arguments, which was stronger than arguments, was for continuing. Mr. Wheeler made a motion to insert an article in the warrant relating to this matter, which was voted down, as were all other proposed articles for town meeting, including expending money to reconstruct the Graniteville Road, to repair the interior of the townhouse, to build horse sheds at the townhouse, to expend $500 draining the new schoolhouse lot. These and many others were discussed favorably, but the meeting 
thought it inexpedient to load the warrant too heavily, and to this end the selectmen have availed themselves of a law requiring the signature of ten voters to get an article in the warrant, if the selectmen consider it necessary. The next section is the Graniteville section. The severe rain of last Saturday made a clean sweep of the snow and ice, and on Sunday morning, many of the backyards had miniature lakes. The scarlet fever tag has again been removed from the house of Mr. and Mrs. Henry Provost in this village. The house has been thoroughly fumigated, and the family are living under normal conditions once more. Miss Mary, the eldest daughter, was the only one sick with the fever, and although all the children were exposed to it, none of them contracted the disease. The fortnightly club held a very interesting meeting in the district school building last week Friday night, and in spite of the inclement weather and bad walking, there were a large number in attendance. Before the business session, the following pleasing program was given under the direction of Mrs. J.W. Blodgett and Mrs. O.A. Nelson, who constituted the entertainment committee. Hymn of praise by the audience, reading Lucy Lambert, song Goodbye Sweetheart Goodbye, Miss Rebe Rebecca LeDuc, reading H.E. Gould, song Is It Very Far to Heaven, Mrs. Emily Blodgett, with violin obligato by Arthur B. Blodgett, Song, College Days, by Alfred Prynne, reading Mrs. Walter Wyman, remarks Mr. Olney, organ solo Mr. Brown, and reading by Henry O. Kyes, K-E-Y-E-S. The entertainment closed with three pretty tableaux entitled Single Blessedness, Not So Blessed, and Blessed Beyond Measures, in which Fred R. Blodgett and Mrs. Nelson were the central figures. The whole affair was voted a great success. In the business meeting that followed, the following officers were elected to the ensuing, to the ensuing term. President Carl Wright, Vice Fred R. Blodgett, Secretary Lucy Lambert, Treasurer Horace E. Gould, Executive Committee Mr. Olney, Edwin Gould, and Mrs. Emily Blodgett. The next section is the, Flo the Forge Village section. Dr. Blaney of Westford was called in some consultation with Dr. Lovejoy of Pepperell last Monday over Hudson Darling, who was so severely injured at East Groton. I believe that was discussed in last week's Westford Wardsman podcast. His mother came from Dedham Monday to see him, and his brother Ellery is caring for him. His injuries are serious. Miss Hanley gave a musicale last Sunday evening. Her pupils acquitted themselves very credibly. William Brown, who injured his foot while cutting ice at air, is able to be out on crutches. The young men of the Athletic Association gave a dance social in Abbott's Hall last week, Friday evening. Kittredge's Orchestra of Air furnished music. Supper was served by the, the quote, the Merry Six. Uh, they are Mrs. Derone, Eva LeClaire, Lena Chagru, Lena and Jesse Wilson, and Catherine Brown. They were complimented very highly for making the affair such a social success. After paying expenses, there was quite a sum for the treasury. At a recent meeting of the Forge baseball team, Charles Flanagan was elected captain and manager, George Weaver secretary, and John Spinner treasurer. The ever-popular concert of Groton Schoolboys will be given in Recitation Hall, Recreation Hall, on Thursday evening, February 27th at 7.45 o'clock. Admission will be only 15 and 10 cents to fit the wage conditions of the times. The Lenten season begins on Ash Wednesday, March 4th, with service in the chapel and sermon by Rev. Dr. Peabody. Uh, this is the famed Reverend Endicott Peabody, who was born in 1857 and died in 1944. He was an American Episcopal priest who founded the Groton School for Boys, now known simply as Groton School, in, in Groton in 1884. And he also founded St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in, in Ayer in October of 1889. The church that opened St. Andrew's Mission in Forge Village and it wasn't 
it was just referred to as the mission in 1908. Uh, it, it garnered the name St. Andrews a year or two later. P Mr. Uh, Mr. Peabody, sir, or Dr. Peabody, served as headmaster at Groton School from 1884 until 1940. He was the headmaster for Franklin D. Roosevelt at Groton, and he officiated at Franklin's marriage to Eleanor Roosevelt, as well as those of their children. Whether or not FDR ever visited St. Andrew's Mission in Forge Village, we don't know. At least I don't know. That's the news in Westford for the week ending February 22, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing techni technical support. You can find transcriptions from the Westford Wardsman at the Westford Historical Society's website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.